Every moment of every day, our brains are sorting through an insane number of inputs trying to make sense of the world. As we do, we end up connecting all sorts of meaning to everything we experience, from the most basic object or number to the most complex idea. And when we discover those connections and even create connections of our own, we have an incredibly powerful tool for creating emotional bonds between us and the people that we serve. But most people don't communicate that way. Most people just talk about what's on the surface and they just stop there. Here's the secret. Just like an iceberg where the greatest mass is hidden under the surface of the water, the true impact of powerful communication comes from the deeper emotions and meaning that we attach to the surface level things. When we communicate at those deeper levels, when people feel positive emotions toward you and your business, that's when they pay attention. Conversations continue and people say yes to what you're offering them. When you know the answer to this question, what is the thing under the thing? Welcome to Speaking of Numbers, the podcast where we empower accounting executives and advisors to go beyond the numbers, to become confident, memorable communicators and thought leaders. When you do, you become the trusted expert in your field, the obvious choice for your clients, and a hero to yourself and your team. My name is Jeff Barch. I spent over 20 years in Hollywood shaping content for clients including ABC, NBC, Universal, Apple, Netflix, and a whole bunch of others. And when I was there, I thought that movies and TV were the point. Turns out the point is much bigger than that. High impact communication that stays in our hearts and minds for years, maybe even changing your life, that kind of communication is a game changer when applied to business especially for client advisory services that require high levels of trust. And here is the good news. That level of communication isn't just for Hollywood big shots or for people giving TED Talks. It comes from ideas that are available to anyone who seeks them and applies them to their own life. And that is what I'm here to share with you in this limited edition podcast. And for the record, this is not a podcast where there are going to be hundreds of episodes every week for you know, dropping every week for hundreds of episodes, got a small pre-planned number of episodes with specific ideas that all build on each other. So make sure you start from the beginning so you can get all these episodes and tools in the right order so you can start putting them to use for yourself. And when it comes to ideas, uh, this one right here may very well be the most powerful yet challenging for some people to wrap their heads around. So my first idea was with these episodes, I wanted to keep them short, but um, I'm not doing that on this one. <laughs> I wanted to put in lots of extra examples to give you as much context as possible. So to set the stage, it's time to roll back the clock about 20 years. And there was a moment in my early 20s when I was standing in a city street with a huge crowd of people waiting for a bell to ring. When that bell started ringing, the crowd went absolutely nuts and the atmosphere was absolutely electric because it wasn't just any bell. It was the bell that most people know as Big Ben, hanging in the clock tower of the British Parliament building in London. It wasn't just any moment of the bell ringing, though, because, you know, that bell rings regularly. Uh, this moment, the clock was striking midnight on New Year's Eve. Now, that's always a cool moment, but this wasn't just any New Year's Eve, because normally in London at New Year's Eve, they have this great big fireworks show, but not this year, because the year was January 1st, 2002. England had canceled official New Year's Eve celebrations because on September 11th, 2001, Terrorists had flown planes into the World Trade Center in New York City, and nobody knew if someone was going to go Guy Fox and try to blow up Parliament or something. So when that bell started ringing, there were no fireworks. But we celebrated. It, I, I mean, champagne was flying through the air. People were yelling, jumping up and down. 
It was a celebration of hope. It was a celebration of life. And it was a declaration that we will not live in fear. That was a moment that I'll remember for a very long time. Uh, it's a powerful moment for me because of what that moment represented. A bell ringing was attached to a collective statement declaring freedom from fear. That connection between a bell in a clock tower and a declaration of freedom is an example of what I call the thing under the thing. And that's the idea that we're digging into on this episode here. And here is what it is. The thing under the thing is a deep fundamental idea or concept attached to a surface level idea. When we engage with that surface level idea, the deeper fundamental idea triggers emotion in us and we feel things. Now, the key here is in that connection because the whole point is to use surface level things or ideas or numbers to point to deep, important ideas that people already care about. When I first started talking about this idea many years ago, the responses I got were immediately along the lines of, whoa, that's powerful. And then people would usually pause and say something like, so exactly how does that work? And that, how does that apply to me? And especially, how does that apply to business? Here's a short answer to how that works. In our communication, we attach what we're talking about to things that our audience already cares about. And when we attach our stuff to deeper things that people already care about, people feel things, which means they buy our stuff. I'm going to just go back and repeat that. When we attach our stuff to deeper things that people already care about, people feel emotions, which means they end up buying our stuff. Now, I'm going to say here, as accounting leaders and client advisors, you have lots of numbers flying through your world. And this idea is going to be huge to help you attach meaning to those numbers so that your people will know that you understand them and what they truly care about. Now, I was going back and forth on what examples to use to unpack this idea. You know, should it be something specifically within the world of accounting or numbers or business? But I decided that I'm going to go outside the advisory world to show you a bigger view of things. Uh, but don't worry, I will. Uh, this is w one of the fundamental concepts that I use with my advisory clients. So I promise we'll get to examples of those too. Now, advertisers and marketing people have known about this concept for a long time. If you ever got into the show Mad Men when it was still on, uh, Eugene Schwartz was one of the original real life Mad Men. He was one of the most respected and highly paid marketing minds in the history of advertising. And he wrote all sorts of advertising books, uh, countless advertising campaigns, including a book that some people consider the best book on copywriting ever written called Breakthrough Advertising. Now, for the records, this sometimes trips people up. We're not talking about having a copyright on something. I'm talking about, you know, like having ownership or control. I'm talking about someone who is a copywriter in terms of someone who writes copy, words, headlines, articles, that sort of thing. Having said that, here is what Eugene Schwartz said in his book, Breakthrough Advertising. Check this out. Copy cannot create desire for a product. It can only take the hopes, dreams, and fears that already exist in the hearts of millions of people and focus those already existing desires onto a particular product. This is the copywriter's task, not to create this mass desire, but to channel and direct it. I'm going to say that again and change out a few words for us in this context here. Communication cannot create emotion by itself. It can only take the hopes, dreams, and fears that already exist in the hearts of millions of people and focus those already existing desires in a particular direction. This is the communicator's task, not to create this mass desire, but to channel and direct it. Think of it this way. It's hard for a sailboat to go anywhere when there's no wind. But when the wind is there and you raise your sails in the right way, you can literally travel across the ocean by harnessing the wind that's already there. 
So that's what we're doing with the thing under the thing. We are attaching a surface level idea or thing to a deeper level feeling or thing that your audience already cares about. Here's the next layer. That connection can already exist or it can be actively created. Let's unpack that. First, let's talk about when it already exists. Now, a lot of the times when that meaning already exists, it shows up as symbolism. Uh, most times the connection between the symbol and the meaning has already been created. And sometimes that connection is clear and it means the same thing to everyone. For example, almost anywhere you go in the world, a green light on a traffic signal is attached to the meaning you can go now. Green, a green light equals permission to go. Evidently, and unless evidently you're in Japan, I guess they have some blue lights instead of green lights. Who knew? Most of the world, though, green means go, uh, and that's pretty clear. But sometimes those connections between surface and deeper meaning can get messy. Imagine, if you will, you have a visual design. You have a collection of white stars on a blue rectangle with red and white stripes. It's an idea. It's a combination of lines and colors in a specific design that people use to represent other things and ideas. Now, you can put this design on nylon cloth that hangs on a pole in front of a building. You can put this design on a patch on the uniform of a man or woman in the military. Uh, you can put this design, you can flash this design up on a jumbotron at a sporting event. Now, these examples are all the thing a piece of weather-resistant cloth on a flagpole, an embroidered patch on some clothing, or an image on a giant TV. In any of these cases, people see this design and immediately know that it is the flag of the United States of America. The power of, this, of these lines and colors, the power of this design comes from the meaning that is attached to it. What does this design mean? What are the core ideas that people have connected this design to? Well, let's just say there are a bunch of ideas attached to this design, and some of, some of them are literally polar opposites of the other, and they are all felt very, very personally by different people. For example, some people look at that flag and they say, that flag means self-reliance. It's a country that's designed to let you create your own life and your own reality of limitless potential. Other people look at that flag and say it represents a country of passivity, a country where people rely on the government to provide for them. Some people say it represents belonging, a place of comfort, of family and friends and uh, a way of life that you love. Other people say, nah, that design represents exclusion. It means it's a place that keeps certain people out, a place where you might be, but you're not welcome and you feel disconnected. You live a way of life that's deeply hurtful and alienating. Some people look at those designs and stripes and colors and they say that represents a country where anyone can be whoever you want to be and achieve anything you want to achieve. It's all about equality. And there are people who look at that same design and say, no, this is about inequality. This is a country whose founders said that all men are created equal. But what they really meant was that the country treats you as if you're created equal if you are a man with white skin, with ancestors from Europe, and you behave and believe in a certain way. And if your skin is not white, if you are not a man, and if you live or believe differently from the Western European folk, that all men are created equal line doesn't really apply to you. So, which of these ideas are right? That depends on, frankly, it depends on who you ask and what connections they've made in their own hearts and minds. Because no matter what, you and I both know that there are people who have made these mental connections between the thing, that design that we call the US flag, and the thing under the thing, just these ideas that I just listed, and thousands more just like them. Now, it's possible that you might be having some reactions of your own right now. Maybe something along the line of, yeah, that's right, that's right. And also maybe of, uh, no, and dude, what's up with the political stuff here? Now, for the record, 
I'm not here to tell you right now what your connection should be between this thing and these things under the thing. That's up to you. But I guarantee you've already made those connections for yourself and you have opinions, maybe very strong opinions about them, even if you don't live in the United States. Anyway, the, the point is, as communicators, we need to know that when we talk about certain surface things, our audience has already made connections in their minds. And when we use the thing to point to those same things under the thing, we trigger people to feel those feelings that they've already put into place. We are pushing our audience's emotional buttons, and they care about that a lot. So this is just one example of a symbol where the audience has already made the connections between the thing and their collections of things under the thing. Let's talk about times when we actively create those connections. Now, this can happen anytime we make a personal, uh, uh, an inside joke with someone else. So there was a time a while back, I don't even remember how this started, but at one point I was joking with my wife and uh, we, we, maybe it was on a road trip or something. And uh, I, I told her that the word moo means I love you in cow. And to this day, Chantel and I still might send each other an emoji of a cow, or we might walk past each other in the, in the house and go, moo, and it still means the same thing. So the thing is a noise from a farm animal, and the thing under the thing is love and relationship. We actively created that by means of an inside joke. Now, beyond that, we all create connections between surface and deeper meanings all the time by our personal choices of what we drive, our clothing, where we eat, all this stuff. So if you wear, for instance, an inexpensive, say, Seiko or Casio watch, maybe the thing under the thing equals thrift. And it means you're sending a message to the world that I keep an eye on personal expenses. Um, if you drive a minivan, well, that can mean lots of different things. In my 20s, that guy who celebrated New Year's Eve in London, that guy drove a green Mustang with custom rims. And the last thing in the world I wanted was to drive a minivan. Oh, <clears throat> I, I even had my own, my, my, my own way of pronouncing it. I said, minivan. I, said, the, the, I used to hate the idea of minivans because to me, it equaled average. 20-something Jeff looked at a minivan, and I said, that means you want to be like everyone else. You want to punch the time clock and don't expect much out of life other than going to soccer games on the weekend, then going back to your drudgery work on Monday. This is all about rule followers driving under the speed limit, dang it. No imagination, nowhere to be going. I did not have... <laughs> positive associations with minivans uh, back, in, uh, back in my previous life. Guess what my family drives now? <laughs> I had to end up changing those mental connections in my head. And at this point, I've mellowed my stance to say that minivan, I have now changed that connection to equal convenience as I don't know, maybe, maybe that's uh, maybe you have or maybe people you know have done the same thing. And I will tell you, you can haul all sorts of stuff and all people in a minivan. And uh, those sliding doors on the side mean there is far less chance of kids in the back going bam and opening up that door and dinging the dinging the doors of cars parked next to you. So uh, and. So that's a super cool thing. I've even decided that when I don't speed, I never have to be on the lookout for police cars lurking in the shadows anymore. So let, let me be clear. I have zero desire to drive under the speed limit, but I'm officially now that guy driving the speed limit in a minivan. My thing under the thing, driving the speed limit equals freedom from worry. I don't have to worry about Am I driving too fast? Am I going to get a ticket? 
please believe that happened more than once when I was the guy driving the Mustang with the custom rims. Uh, and also it's driving the speed limit equals setting an example for my kids. Uh, they're not driving yet, but that day will come soon enough. And I might just be a little bit freaked out about it, but I'll deal. <laughs> the point is, we all create connections and surface uh, between surface and deeper meanings on purpose in our own lives. And the exact same thing happens in business, too. Time warp. Again, not back to the year 2001. Let's go back to the 1880s. Now, at that point, steam engines and railroads moved freight all across the country. <clears throat> but trucks didn't exist yet. Trucks had not been invented yet. So how were large, heavy things moved around cities? Well, at that point, most people used horses, often really big horses. And uh, there is a, there's a particular breed of horse called the Clydesdale, who were known to be a powerful breed of horse that could carry loads of up to one ton at a walking speed of five miles per hour. So in a world where commercial trucks hadn't been invented, these Clydesdales were often used to carry large loads of beer to and from breweries like that of Anheuser-Busch. And over time, those Clydesdale horses became a symbol of that company. In 1920, Congress outlawed alcohol. When that law was repealed, when Prohibition ended in 1933, the Bush brothers celebrated by presenting their father with a six-horse hitch of Clydesdales pulling a red, white, and gold beer wagon, just like the old days. And the brothers, being marketing-minded, they realized its marketing potential, and they started sending that horse-drawn carriage all over the country. They even delivered a case of beer to President Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. So that connection of horses equals beer was created on purpose by Anheuser-Busch for their Budweiser brand, and they've been doing it ever since. And of course, TV commercials have taken that connection and it's turned it into a whole life of its own, especially TV commercials during, during Super Bowl. Uh, they have cemented even more connections. Horses plus dogs equals beer and football. Connections, all created on purpose. Now, those connections between surface elements were strengthened and are strengthened by connections under the surface. So when you start thinking about what are the things under the thing for Budweiser beer, well, you have Budweiser Clydesdales. That means tradition. They've been pulling beer wagons since the 1800s. But in more general terms, you have huge horses equals power and majesty. And when you have a TV commercial with slow motion shots of galloping horses in an open field, that has a whole other list of things that it connects to. Things like freedom, maybe the idea of the Old West or of the cowboy, independence, self-determination, rugged individualism, America, all the things. Uh, you get a TV commercial for Budweiser that has a dog in it. Dogs equal companionship and loyalty. Beer equals community, friendship, family, connection, tradition. Football equals battle, overcoming the enemy, team identity, tribe identity. You could go on and on about this stuff. And this stuff is all present whether people realize it or not. And it's been building for well over a century which is why you have to be really careful with these connections. When marketing leaders at the Bud Light brand agreed to a sponsorship with transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney, all of a sudden they were creating a connection between Bud Light and the transgender community. So this is a challenge when you have a product that is sold to a wide range of people. The conservative members of their consumer base said, um, no, we don't agree with this connection and we are going to stop drinking your beer and we are going to happily tell everyone we know to stop drinking it too. On the other side, the liberal members of their consumer base said, uh, Budweiser says 
it's creating this con- connection with the transgender community, but it's not standing up for Dylan Mulvaney the way we think they should. So your company is fake. We don't support fakeness in companies, and we are also going to stop drinking your beer. So everyone was mad. And within weeks, InBev, the parent company of Anheuser-Busch, lost $27 billion with a B dollars of market value. Next thing you know, Budweiser's public messaging is back full steam ahead with Clydesdales, dogs, football, and tradition. So these ideas aren't just important for beer. They are important for any business. And here's the next layer to this. These connections between surface and deeper meaning affect people, whether you directly speak to those connections or not. Now, heads up, I'm about to tell you a story about Steve Jobs that you might have heard before, but I promise I have an angle to it that you almost certainly have not heard before. So jumping back again into the time machine to the year 2001, which in some ways feels like a lifetime ago to me, but in other ways doesn't feel like all that long ago at all. Chances are you remember the year 2001 and the fact that everyone at that point was still using physical media to listen to music. Maybe not eight tracks, maybe not vinyl, but people were definitely using cassette tapes and lots and lots of CDs. Folks were just starting to say, hey, let's introduce new digital music players. And the people who did talked about megabytes and how many pieces of data you could fit on these little digital sticks. Now, in sales terms, everyone was talking about the features. And as any good salesperson will tell you, don't sell the features, sell the benefits. When Steve Jobs got on stage to introduce the first ever iPod, he did mention some features, but he focused on the benefits. And here's what this means to you. We want to put a thousand songs in your pocket. Now, that's where most people stop with with the whole thing about jobs. But here's where this connects to the thing under the thing. The reason that benefits persuade people is because it speaks to the things that people actually care about. It connects the surface level thing, a little gadget called the iPod, to the things under the thing that are the true motivation. So here's the extra layer. The iPod benefits were not just about having a thousand songs in your pocket. It's what that represented. That was, this is what truly drove that phrase. And you get the hint from this, from all the TV commercials that Apple released for years later. They had lots of bright colors and animations on the screen. And they had, they had silhouettes of people dancing with with earbuds in their ears. They were dancing to the music because iPod didn't just represent a thousand songs in your pocket. It represented freedom. It represented freedom from physical media. No longer do you have to carry around stacks of cassette tapes or big binders of CDs. It meant freedom to have instant access to the soundtrack of your life in your ears Anytime you want it. That is the thing under the thing for the little gadget called the iPod. Now, here is an important point. In any given conversation, the thing under the thing is always there, but it won't always be stated out loud. For instance, if Steve Jobs had gotten up on stage and said, this is the iPod, it will give you personal freedom. uh, People would have just kind of looked at each other and said, uh, what? What? The fact is, that was still the underlying emotional driver for the general public. But that's not what the message needed to be. Because especially with marketing, the message has to be a specific promise. Here is what you will get. Here is what's in it for you. This is how you will benefit from what we're offering. That's why Jobs made that specific promise of a thousand songs in your pocket. That's why at Story Greenlight, we talk about things like helping your clients become the trusted expert in your field, helping you become the obvious choice for your clients. Those are specific promises that point to deeper motivations like promise of higher industry status and trust, 
People choose you instead of everyone else who does what you do, which means more money, more clients, more security for you. We don't, we don't come out saying, work with Story Greenlight because you'll feel like you have higher status. Well, no, that's, that's not the point. The point is not to have higher status, it's not to give you an ego boost. It's about to be, it's about giving you tools of being greater service to your clients and to yourself at the same time. So again, those underlying drivers are always going to be there, but our messages should always be crafted in light of them, whether we mention them or not. And the best communicators craft that message in light of the deeper thing into the thing, because that's what ultimately connects to what people actually feel and care about, which means they act on it. So at this point, hopefully you've gotten a bigger view on what the thing under the thing is and how it works. And as promised, let's apply it to the advisory world. Now, there are all sorts of ways that we could go here, but let's start with these. Going to go two different directions here. There's the idea of shaping messaging in light of an overall industry. And then there's the idea of shaping messaging in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So when you work with clients, uh, one of the things that I always do is to make sure that I understand and the advisor is aware of the overall emotional and psychological drivers of their industry and their clients. And this affects everything with the communication. It affects individual client conversations. It affects public messaging, um, website, social media content, you name it. So last year, I was working with an advisor who does CFO advising to mid-sized legal firms. And here are some of the core issues that it became clear we need to keep these in mind when he interacts with clients or puts his message out into public. And by the way, these industry issues don't have to be crazy things like liberty or family or justice or belonging. They can be things like avoidance, sticking your head in the sand. Uh, one of the things about lawyers, according to my client, is that they like to ignore issues. They ignore things like biz dev and pipeline, and they like to focus on things like law, stuff that they know. Uh, now, some firms are scrappy, especially if you're working with a personal injury firm. Uh, when it comes to filling their pipeline, they drop signs on buses and they plaster their faces on billboards. They will do anything they need to do when it comes to marketing. Other firms are more prestige driven and they wouldn't dream of putting their face on a billboard or public advertising, but they still need to keep their pipeline filled like anyone else. They can't just ignore business realities. And that's where my client gets to offer more value by reminding them of what they need to take care of and ways that they can make it happen. One of the other issues, one of the other things under the thing for legal firms is the idea of predictability of distributions. Firm partners hate to not get their, their distributions when they expect them. And as bad as that is, they would rather have their teeth pulled than have to have their money put back into their business if surprises pop up. Evidently, that's just not ever cool. Now, my client's been around the block. He knows all these things when it comes to interacting with clients. So I worked with him to shape his public messaging in light of these things that he already knew, but he hadn't really thought about from a public-facing communication standpoint. Now, compare the world of law firms to a completely different world, the world of cannabis. Now, one of my clients, uh, his name is Guillermo. He does financial consulting for cannabis operations with annual revenues between two and 30 million. Before I worked with him, I knew next to nothing about the cannabis world. And I was absolutely blown away by some of the things that I learned. When you look at the industry as a whole, there's this, there's this vibe of the world is against us. Now, some people love to talk like this and pretend to be the martyr, but cannabis folks, they have some serious obstacles. 
just just as a beginning point, here in the U.S., medical and recreational marijuana is legal in some states, but it's illegal in others. But no matter its legality at the state level, it is always illegal at the federal level because it's labeled by the DEA as a Schedule One illegal substance. It's officially lumped together in the same category as PCP and heroin. Uh, there are a lot of people who, right now saying that cannabis should be descheduled, uh, it's rescheduled to Schedule Three, be a Schedule Three substance. But as of this recording, it's still Schedule One, which means national banks won't touch you. They will shut you down. I mean, if you do the cannabis, if you do anything in the cannabis business, these national banks will shut you down. They will shut you down if you even consult for cannabis companies. They will freeze your business accounts and your personal accounts because national banks can't risk being attached to illegal activity at the federal level. Uh, it's also almost impossible to take digital payments. Visa and MasterCard won't touch you with a 10-foot pole. It's also really hard and expensive to get approval to buy real estate, never mind financing. But, that's, but all that stuff, that's just the warm-up. The 800-pound gorilla for the cannabis industry is it has to do with taxes. Because it's still a Schedule I substance at the federal level, that means that any business who operates legally in any state is still taxed federally as an illegal business under IRS tax code section 280E. And under 280E, that means that unlike any other business, cannabis companies are not allowed to deduct ordinary business expenses before calculating their tax liability. There are some exceptions for cost of goods, but not much else. So even if it's legal at the state level, because cannabis is still a Schedule I substance at the federal level, its effective tax rate will usually end up between 70 and 100 percent on its gross revenue. And I'm thinking to myself, that is a crazy stack of obstacles in the way of the industry, which means there has to be a crazy strong motivation in the opposite direction to keep things going. So what I've found is when you start talking to people in the industry, they talk about the freedom to choose. Now, the cynic will say, dude, hello, you smoke marijuana, you get high. Of course, people are going to want that. But there are a lot of people who will say, this is not just about, this is not just about relaxation or pleasure. This is about freedom to choose. It's perfectly legal to drink alcohol. Why is it so terrible to smoke a joint? That's what a lot of people will say. Uh, so it can be on that kind of a, you know, this is not life or death kind of a thing. For other people, it is more serious, more closer to life or death, especially for ongoing health issues. Uh, the more you talk to people there, the more that you hear them say that they want freedom to make their own health choices. For example, a friend of mine is a former Navy SEAL. Uh, he has had multiple deployments overseas and more near-death experiences than anyone that I know. Uh, he received an honorable discharge for medical reasons that were a serious challenge for him for a while. And he found that certain cannabis-related medical treatments worked when nothing else would. There is something else that I've learned from all my years in TV telling stories there. Uh, there are genetic diseases like, uh, like the disease known as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that absolutely destroy the bodies of people who have it. And over and over, I hear stories of CBD-based treatments who have given relief and even reversed symptoms when nothing else would from standard medicine. So just to compare, just to compare thing under the thing issues between the legal industry and the cannabis industry, legal firms care about predictable distributions to the partners. Cannabis operations, sometimes they're just happy to be solvent at all, but they care about preserving personal freedom. So these are two very, very different conversations, but you have to know this stuff because these are the things that people care about in their own industry. Now, some people might say, Jeff, isn't this just part of learning any industry? Doesn't everyone have to learn this stuff for themselves? And the thing is, yes, 
people do need to learn these things. And the more experienced an advisor is, the more likely they are to know the ins and, their, of, and the outs of the psychology of their industry. But I guarantee you, not everyone learns this stuff. Uh, and a lot of advisors uh, either don't learn these things at all or they end up learning about them the hard way. Here's the bigger point, though. When you figure out what the emotional and psychological drivers are in any given industry, those are a big deal for the people in that industry. And it affects every part of your communication. You need to speak to those things because when you do, your clients in those industries will know that you know what's important to them. And when you do, you will build deeper layers of trust and connection and the better off everyone will be. And that becomes even more obvious when you interact with clients one-on-one. -on -one. There was a time when I was talking with my client by the name of Hannah. She's a fractional CFO. She has a, a group of clients that she supports. And uh, one client uh, was, the, was the CEO and owner of her company. The end client was the CEO. Uh, she was looking at a number, an eight-figure number. And so for our conversation here, that number is the thing. So numbers are just numbers, right? They just kind of sit there. They don't mean anything, right? Well, in this case, that number meant a lot because to Hannah's CEO client, that number represented her company's EBITDA. And that number had that meaning attached to it on purpose. And it just wasn't, it wasn't just about the EBITDA. That client had worked for years to build her company and she wanted to get that number as high as possible to move her toward her dream of selling her company. So the thing was a number attached to the meaning, things under the thing of hard work, struggle, good work done, client served, possibility for financial reward, reward in the future that makes other projects possible. This is what happens when you attach meaning to numbers. Here's the problem. Hannah's client wanted to protect her company value in the future, but she also cares deeply about compensating her team right now. So her obstacle in this scenario was she felt like she had to choose between her company and all those things that that EBITDA number represented. She felt like she had to choose between that and her people. And it seemed to her like it was an either or decision. I talked with Hannah about this in one of our one-on-one -on -one calls, and I talked with her about the thing under the thing and asked questions, and we ended up coming to the place where we could both see what was on Hannah's mind and what was on the mind of her CEO and client. And we worked with some tools that I use in client work, and Hannah came up with the idea of a scale. She was thinking that the issues were about balance, not either or. And that reframing of the scenario completely changed the information that Hannah was looking for as she was going through the numbers. And she presented uh, in the next meeting with her client, she presented a cash flow projection in light of the company's EBITDA and said, I think you can honor both sides. Here are some options about how to cover that balance. And Hannah told me, she could almost see a physical weight lifting off her client's shoulders. She was so relieved that by the end of the call, both she and Hannah were in tears of happiness. It's really easy to do what everyone else does and just talk about surface level things, uh, the obvious stuff. But the stuff that matters is the stuff that's under the surface, the things under the thing. And when we speak to what our people truly care about, that's when people trust you, they do business with you, they stay longer, and they bring their friends. The stuff right here is the closest thing that I've found to emotional superglue. Uh, it requires specific knowledge used in specific ways to specific people in order for it to work. But when it does, it is powerful. If you'd like to talk about how this might work for you or your team, that's what I'm here for. Sometimes it's as simple as one conversation. Uh, if you'd like to have a conversation like that, drop me a line via email, hello at storygreenlight.com. And hopefully the examples in this episode show that this idea of the thing under the thing, it's everywhere and it can bring incredibly powerful results personally 
and professionally. So to see those results for yourself, reach out to hello at storygreenlight.com and make sure to check out the next episode because we're going to be pulling back the curtain on how to use tactical storytelling in a way that truly connects with your audience. Storytelling can get complicated if you let it, but I promise it doesn't have to be. And it is not just for the chosen few on a big stage or the people who have the gift of gab. It is possible for anyone to learn the ideas, keep things focused, and to see the results for yourself. Until then, I'm Jeff Barch. This is Speaking of Numbers, and we'll see you on the next episode.